Francisco was 15 years old that summer. When I run Danconia Copper, I'm studying mining and mineralogy because I must be ready for the time when I run Danconia Copper. I'm studying electrical engineering because power companies are the best customers of Danconia Copper. I'm going to study philosophy because I'll need it to protect Danconia Copper. Don't you ever think of anything but Danconia Copper? Jim asked him once. No. It seems to me that there are other things in the world. Let others think about them. Isn't that a very selfish attitude? It is. What are you after? Money. Don't you have enough? In his lifetime, every one of my ancestors raised the production of Danconia Copper by about ten percent. I intend to raise it by one hundred. What for? Jim asked in sarcastic imitation of Francisco's voice. When I die, I hope to go to heaven, whatever the hell that is, and I want to be able to afford the price of admission. Virtue is the price of admission, Jim said haughtily. That's what I mean, James. So I want to be prepared to claim the greatest virtue of all, that I was a man who made money. Any grafter can make money. James, you ought to discover some day that words have an exact meaning. Francisco smiled. It was a smile of radiant mockery. Watching them, Dagny thought suddenly of the difference between Francisco and her brother Jim. Both of them smiled derisively, but Francisco seemed to laugh at things because he saw something much greater. Jim laughed as if he wanted to let nothing remain great. She noticed the particular quality of Francisco's smile again one night when she sat with him and Eddie at a bonfire they had built in the woods. The glow of the fire enclosed them within a fence of broken, moving strips that held pieces of tree trunks, branches, and distant stars. She felt as if there were nothing beyond that fence, nothing but black emptiness, with the hint of some breath-stopping, frightening promise, like the future. But the future, she thought, would be like Francisco's smile. There was the key to it the advance warning of its nature, in his face in the firelight under the pine branches. And suddenly she felt an unbearable happiness, unbearable because it was too full and she had no way to express it. She glanced at Eddie. He was looking at Francisco. In some quiet way of his own, Eddie felt as she did. Why do you like Francisco? she asked him weeks later when Francisco was gone. Eddie looked astonished. It had never occurred to him that the feeling could be questioned. He said, He makes me feel safe. She said, He makes me expect excitement and danger. Francisco was sixteen next summer, the day when she stood alone with him on the summit of a cliff by the river, their shorts and shirts torn in their climb to the top. They stood looking down the Hudson. They had heard that on clear days one could see New York in the distance, but they saw only a haze made of three different kinds of light merging together, the river, the sky, and the sun. She knelt on a rock leaning forward, trying to catch some hint of the city, the wind blowing her hair across her eyes. She glanced back over her shoulder and saw that Francisco was not looking at the distance. He stood looking at her. It was an odd glance, intent, and unsmiling. She remained still for a moment, her hands spread flat on the rock, her arms tensed to support the weight of her body. Inexplicably, his glance made her aware of her pose, of her shoulder showing through the torn shirt, of her long, scratched, sunburned legs slanting from the rock to the ground. She stood up angrily and backed away from him, and while throwing her head up, resentment in her eyes to meet the sternness in his, while feeling certain that his was a glance of condemnation and hostility. She heard herself asking him, a tone of smiling defiance in her voice, What do you like about me? He laughed. She wondered, aghast, what had made her say it. He answered, There's what I like about you, pointing to the glittering rails of the Taggart station in the distance. It's not mine, she said, disappointed. What I like is that it's going to be. She smiled, conceding his victory by being openly delighted. She did not know why he had looked at her so strangely. 
but she felt that he had seen some connection which she could not grasp between her body and something within her that would give her the strength to rule those rails some day. He said brusquely, Let's see if we can see New York, and jerked her by the arm to the edge of the cliff. She thought that he did not notice that he twisted her arm in a peculiar way, holding it down along the length of his side. It made her stand pressed against him, and she felt the warmth of the sun in the skin of his legs against hers. They looked far out into the distance, but they saw nothing ahead except a haze of light. When Francisco left that summer, she thought that his departure was like the crossing of a frontier which ended his childhood. He was to start college that fall. Her turn would come next. She felt an eager impatience, touched by the excitement of fear, as if he had leaped into an unknown danger. It was like the moment years ago when she had seen him dive first from a rock into the Hudson, had seen him vanish under the black water, and had stood knowing that he would reappear in an instant and that it would then be her turn to follow. She dismissed the fear. Dangers to Francisco were merely opportunities for another brilliant performance. There were no battles he could lose, no enemies to beat him. And then she thought of a remark she had heard a few years earlier. It was a strange remark, and it was strange that the words had remained in her mind, even though she had thought them senseless at the time. The man who said it was an old professor of mathematics, a friend of her father, who came to the country house for just that one visit. She liked his face, and she could still see the peculiar sadness in his eyes when he said to her father one evening, sitting on the terrace in the fading light, pointing to Francisco's figure in the garden, That boy is vulnerable. He has too great a capacity for joy. What will he do with it in a world where there is so little occasion for it? Francisco went to a great American school which his father had chosen for him long ago. It was the most distinguished institution of learning left in the world, the Patrick Henry University of Cleveland. He did not come to visit her in New York that winter, even though he was only a night's journey away. They did not write to each other. They had never done it. But she knew that he would come back to the country for one summer month. There were a few times that winter when she felt an undefined apprehension, the professor's words kept returning to her mind as a warning which she could not explain. She dismissed them. When she thought of Francisco, she felt the steadying assurance that she would have another month as an advance against the future, as a proof that the world she saw ahead was real, even though it was not the world of those around her. Hi, Slug. Hi, Frisco. Standing on the hillside in the first moment of seeing him again, she grasped suddenly the nature of that world which they together held against all others. It was only an instant's pause. She felt her cotton skirt beating in the wind against her knees, felt the sun on her eyelids, and the upward thrust of such an immense relief that she ground her feet into the grass under her sandals, because she thought she would rise weightless through the wind. It was a sudden sense of freedom and safety, because she realized that she knew nothing about the events of his life, had never known, and would never need to know. The world of chance, of families, meals, schools, people, of aimless people dragging the load of some unknown guilt, was not theirs, could not change him, could not matter. He and she had never spoken of the things that happened to them, but only of what they thought and of what they would do. She looked at him silently, as if a voice within her were saying, not the things that are, but the things we'll make. We are not to be stopped, you and I. Forgive me the fear, if I thought I could lose you to them. Forgive me the doubt, they'll never reach you. I'll never be afraid for you again. He too stood looking at her for a moment, and it seemed to her that it was not a look of greeting after an absence, but the look of someone who had thought of her every day of that year. She could not be certain. It was only an instant, so brief that just as she caught it, he was turning to point at the birch tree behind him, and saying in the tone of their childhood game, I wish you'd learn to run faster. I'll always have to wait for you. Will you wait for me? she asked gaily. He answered without smiling, Always. As they went up the hill to the house, he spoke to Eddie, while she walked silently by his side. She felt that there was a new reticence between them, which, strangely, was a new kind of intimacy. 
She did not question him about the university. Days later she asked him only whether he liked it. They're teaching a lot of drivel nowadays, he answered. But there are a few courses I like. Have you made any friends there? Two. He told her nothing else.